have two of Design's luminaries here, geniuses. I don't even know what other accolades I could say, could say about you two. We have Eddie Opara, and then we also have Suzanne McKenzie. Um, I'm just gonna read their bios to you because I, I, it just, there's so much here, um, amazing stuff. So Eddie was born in Wandsworth, uh, England. Yeah, Wandsworth, London, yeah. London. That's right. Yeah. 1972. Oh. Just kidding, I'm not gonna. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> you can see the gray. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you also study graphic design in the London College and uh, printing and Yale, at Yale University. You got your MFA there in 1997. Uh, yeah. You began your career in design at AGT and Imaginary Forces. You also worked as a senior designer and art director of Two by Four. Uh, he also, this is before he established his own studio, the MAP office in 2005. Uh, and then he joined Pentagram, uh, their New York office here in, as a partner in yeah. 2010. Okay, let me just list his clients, okay? Because this is pretty major. Um, they've included Lululemon, Athletica, Re-Inc, Oppo, Samsung, Dash Lane, SF MoMA, uh, the New Republic, Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, Grace Farms, the Manil Foundation, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Queens Museum, St. Regis Hotels, and the Corcoran Group. I could go on and on and on, but you get an idea of Eddie. He's amazing. So, Eddie, Suzanne um, is also equally as amazing. She's founder and creative chief creative officer of Able Maid. We all know this. Uh, it's a responsibly, actually, I'm going to let you talk about Able Maid. Um, uh, you lost your husband suddenly to cardiac arrest while he was playing the sport he loved. This is soccer, right? And uh, you founded the UCAL McKinsey Breakaway Foundation in his name to support inner city youth through access of, to soccer, health, art, education, and merging his passions of high school guide, as a high school gu guidance counselor, soccer coach, and city youth mentor with your own design uh, and collaboration, your passion for design and collaboration. Able May was created to support the foundation and empower city youth. All right, let me just list who you've partnered with too, because this is pretty crazy. While leading Able Made, you have secured designer collaborations with Puma, Swell, Threadless, Project Runway, Apple's Allen Dye, Pamela Love, so much more. You've raised awareness and funds for Pencils of Promise, VH1, Save the Music Foundation, CFDA Fashion Targets Breast Cancer, Guggenheim Museum, The Met, Gosh, the High Line, and of course, you Cal McKinsey's Breakaway Foundation. So, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me into your space, I should say. And um, so happy to have you. I'm really excited to be here. So, Eddie, I'm going to quote you back to you. Okay. Uh, this is a quote from Eddie. Obviously, design is not about solving problems; it's about making people happy. And there is always so many personalities to consider and ideas to consider. So you are trying to simplify its fundamental structure, all right? You both are involved in companies, as I said, that really merge sports, wellness, active activity, and activism. How does that, I mean, doesn't that, I mean, you also are dealing with people who are, you know, are, are marginal, youth that are marginalized, people that are marginalized. Would you say, Design, how do, you, how do you elevate design so that it's not only, I mean, technically your companies are trying to help people, right? But also make people happy. So where does that intersection come? Is it a fine line? Um, in a sense, it can be seen as a fine line depending on the context. But, um, you know, let me just try to unravel what I was saying first. Yes. Um, and what, what I really believe in. Since the day dot, I have had this um, this sort of whispering in my ear, or specific statements in, in books that said, you know, graphic design or design is about solving problems, and um, and I would always sort of scratch my head because uh, I would always consider, well, <clears throat> number one, if I've created all these particular options. Um, Am I solving a specific problem for that particular client? And okay. that client's going to pick it because of certain um, aspects, certain um, uh, attributes towards that specific design. Like, you nailed it with this, you nailed it with that one, you nailed it, you know, with you know, a particular element within that particular design. But also on that design, you're, you're really bringing
bringing this particular attribute out a little bit more? How can we put those two things together? And I'm like, well, this is not a, this is, this is not a very easy equation to sort of uh, uh, you know, perform. And uh, you know, my, my sister's a, um, a biochemist, a scientist, and she solves flipping problems. Um, <laughs> Um, but very design, complex things. But this is, you're also solving very complex things. I mean, let's think about this. Like, helping marginalized people is not an easy thing to solve. I mean, we've seen governments try to do this. We've seen people, world leaders, activists. You both, through your companies, and by the way, I want you to, when I say you're, through your companies that you've worked with, just tell us a little bit about Reink. Oh, okay. So, um, and then I'll go back to try and answer your question. Okay, sure. <laughs> So, um, you know, Reink um, is is made up of um, Kristen Press, uh, Tobin Heath, Megan Rapino, Megan Klingenberg. If you know those names, they're well famous um, uh, soccer stars, what I call football, um, world renowned, world champions, and they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, they came to me with a uh, an overarching concept about bringing a, um, uh, a company, an organization, um, a way of thinking um, about um, the aspects of diversity, inclusivity through lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, wear. And it's not just only clothing, it's also building community, building out the aspects of designing posters or books or uh, whatever they they put their minds to and their hearts to, and um, you know we said yes. Um, now one of the aspects of re is that you know we try to um, it's a, it's a great it's a great um, term it's a great name. How does one try to expose them more in regards to the inclusivity and the diversity and sustainable aspects of who they are, that, 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 that non-binary. Through design. Through design, that non-binary element. And so, it, it, you know, in a sense, you know, re with that E, which is backwards, uh, is, is something that exists already within the uh, Roman um, um, character set, the Roman glyph system. Nobody really knows that. But if you're sort of looking at E, um, E is the most common uh, character uh, in Roman. And when I say Roman, in Western uh, language that you would <coughs> use. So the idea of commonality has been shifted. Um, and in just a very, by flipping the just letter. Just by flipping the letter. And so then it becomes fundamentally something that uh, is representative of who they actually are. Um, and, um, and that sense, sense of simplicity is there. Now, I'm not saying that we solved the problem. We, we basically enhanced them and made them actually happy, mm -hmm. happier. We actually exposed who they really are, right? Uh, and also But towards... one would argue, too, that making them happy has also elevated their visibility. That's correct. Ergo, trying to help solve a problem. Suzanne, Suicide. your company does something very similar, which is focusing on activists and acti activity and activism. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over uh, allergies. Um, I'm tested, it's all okay. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, how would you say that your company is trying to solve this problem? So for me, growing up, my dad actually worked for Ben and Jerry's. So that was my first touch point, not only of having pints and pints of ice cream in my fridge at all times, we were like the most popular people in the neighborhood, um, but it was my first touch point of a consumer product that had a mission or had values and really married values and value. Um, so I had a really early introduction to what that could look like. And my formal background is in branding and design and strategy. So after about 12 years um, in the industry, um, I lost my husband. And I really, like, I only made it through, and I'm not exaggerating, um, because of my design community and working on the foundation to get myself through that hard, horrible time in my life. And um, products, you know, for me, were a way to celebrate, to show a bright light, 
to collaborate um, on artwork and just wake up and see something beautiful was like life changing mm -hmm. and life saving, you know, um, to be honest. So um, for me, we are giving back to city youth health through camps and it's very simple it seems, but um, we're gonna be 13 next year, which is insane. So shout out to mm -hmm. the Breakaway Congratulations, Foundation. Congratulations, yes. Um, we're in three markets now and we're, we're really serving and aiming to serve families from lower income households, single parent or guardian households, and I work the camps, and my team for Able May works the camps. So we're on the ground and seeing and talking to the families and the kids and seeing the challenges. And when I'm having a hard day at work, I can just look back at some of the pictures and be like, listen, this is worth it. This is what we're doing with Able May. We were born to fund the foundation. So, you know, at a uh, base level, you know, it seems really simple products that give back or building a foundation, but it's all kind of intermixed with the idea of design being a very strong tool for social change. So in that same vein, I was reading an article in the Washington Post about an organization called In the Streets. And if you all haven't heard of it, it's called, um, it, what's called In the Streets, but it's also a black-led organization building meaningful livelihoods and disrupting generational trauma, okay? It's really important stuff and work that they are doing. And Dr. Sangeetha Prasad, who also happens to be a family friend of mine. I have to be transparent with him, but she's pretty awesome. Um, she's one of the founders of this, and it, she was saying, and I'm gonna quote her, minority communities don't trust therapists, and in part, it's for good reason. And she also goes on to say, even with the best of intentions, too often they don't have the education or background to address generational trauma and systematic oppression. How does design help to heal those deep wounds? I'm gonna ask you, Eddie, first. Yeah, um, you know, right now, um, with the aspects of design, um, the, the amount that there's 3% of um, designers in the US that are, are people of color. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to start off with that. And that, that's just crazy. That, that number is astronomically terrible. And why is that the case? Um, it is the case because of um, systematic racism, um, That's systemic so low. elements. Three percent. Three percent is is nuts. Um, so when I came to this country, um, you know, in my in my my year at, in London, even though it's really low there, there was at least um, eight to ten of us who were of people um, of color. And I come from a tiny island the size of New York mm -hmm. <laughs> State. Um, and, um, but they, you know, the aspects of Britain really believing in design is a very important factor. When I came here, it was in, entirely different. But just getting to the point um, now, the systemic issues in regards to helping, um, you know, children of color um, understand what design is to elevate themselves out of where they are. My, my father, before I left, um, uh, to uh, the United States said design is spiritual. Mm -hmm. Now, that's another one that you have to sort of unravel. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, it, it, it has a certain sense of ethics and mor a moral standing towards it. And it also is about enhancing people's lives, right? Now, um, uh, beyond, um, um, beyond their idea of who they are and on what they are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And you're not thinking about yourself. And the aspect of spirituality is the idea of transcending above yourself as well. So if you really consider that, that that's an important factor. Now, the, the, uh, the aspect of how do you lift uh, a generation of children um, that, number one, would like to be a fashion designer or a graphic designer, or an architect, or an industrial designer, is that we need to we need to go to those schools. So there is um, an initiative uh, a, um, that's um, developed by Herman Miller that I'm part of, mm -hmm. uh, the DID uh, initiative, that is now has has about I would say 30 to 40 well-known companies, design companies, or design focused companies that are that are, are, are putting together the best practices for a, a better awareness for 
um, uh, for children of color um, at high school um, and middle school at also um, um, HBCUs as well, um, and being a collective force, we're mentoring, um, we're trying to establish a different type of foundation for, um, for a generation of um, African American and um, um, kids of color to become better performers um, in design today. And maybe not, you know, maybe looking at people of color and not thinking about their past traumas and that, what we've yeah, all that's correct. kind of come up from. That's correct. And 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 are I mean, sure it's, it's yeah. part of our histories, but I mean, Suzanne, you were talking about how when you you know, when you were going through this terrible time in your life, design really helped you come out of it because you got to see something so beautiful every single day and it really drew you out of that. In the same vein, right, how would design, I mean, we're talking about, and I'm not saying we're gonna solve, I'm sure if we could solve this tonight, we would be, you know, <laughs> up for Nobel Prizes. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we're, we have generational trauma. Um, how would you say that your company and design in general is helping to kind of heal that through activism and activity? One of the most moving things that I've witnessed as part of the Breakaway Foundation is um, a few years ago, um, we were in our second market, Hartford, and uh, one of the volunteers was a teenager in high school, and he came to the camp very distraught, but the night before, his best friend was shot and killed because of gun violence. And I'm getting goosebumps, but like, it was just, I couldn't believe he showed up, but he just wanted a safe place. He wanted a place where he can get his mind off of things for even a few minutes. And um, it was just so moving. And, you know, the the design of the program created a safe space at like a very basic elementary level. And to me, that's design. Mm -hmm. You know, it's creating an experience. And likewise, for Able May, we're really focused on uh, using better materials, so things that don't have pesticides, fabrics that don't have pesticides, so when the workers are putting together the garments, they're not exposed to pesticides. Um, and then also we're really diligent with the factories we choose and, and the conditions and the fair pay. Um, so every thread, and like my design team wants to kill me, but like every thread I'm like, we can't use plastic or like this needs to be better or this is a certain standard we wanna hold. So like it's, it's 10 times, probably 100 times harder to do it this way but we have a commitment to um, uplift communities through all touch points, whether it's a product or an event or a camp. Yeah. Can I, can I add a, a, a bit to that as well? Um, you know, the, what we've also tried to do and establish at Pentagram is um, to, you know, we, we teach at, you know, really, you know, elite schools, Yale's, the SVA's, um, the Parsons of the world, mm -hmm. and um, we've turned that down a, a, a fair notch by going into community colleges uh, like Mercy College or, uh, and um, other colleges such as uh, CCNY, who actually have design um, uh, groups. With Mercy College, um, they've set up a system called Connect4 mm -hmm. where it started off with four mentees and mentors and then you have them for six months you really try to mold exactly where they're coming from my my first uh, mentee um, came from a family that didn't want her to do design they wanted her to stay at home uh, to get married mm -hmm. um, you know these these aspects they, they were forcing us she, they, she basically had to run away um, and you know she found solace within the aspects of design and um, she's, you know, she's a very good designer. She's found, um, you know, a fantastic job, and she's she's elevating herself. And the idea of giving these um, these students confidence, mm -hmm. right? And confidence is a really hard thing to find. Where where they actually fit in is is important. And um, especially when you've experienced trauma. That's correct. Yeah. And, and, and actually systematic trauma. That's right. Oppression of like generations and generations. That's right. And so looking at it from the point of view of your spirit, your inner spirit to actually help others 
elevate themselves no matter what, like an individual or a community or a large corporation, that gives you purpose, right? Um, it makes you happy that you are delivering this. It's more than solving problems, right? right? Yeah. yeah. You're changing yeah. a financial structure that's of correct. a community and a generation. Yeah. I think that's really, I always say money, money equals power. So, um, you know, and, yeah. and it's also a tool. Yeah. They can really elevate uh, people and, and get them out of situations. I've seen it, you know, throughout communities here and in India. So, um, well, let's talk about the branding process, right? Um, I am a financial journalist. I don't know much about the branding process or design, uh, but I do cover fashion design and retail, so I know that aspect of it. Um, so, you know, what I found really interesting is, as I was doing research for this uh, for this panel, um, the idea of sports branding and sports marketing and how a color, a logo, uh, you know, the way like. The best example, and maybe this is a little trite, but the Nike Swish. I mean, it, 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 I'm a runner, so I'm like a Nike person, so I feel like I'm a part of this community. Um, but let's talk about how both of you, in your designs and specifically with the companies that you are, are, are involved with, how do you use color, um, art, um, to, to, to really grow a community and, yeah. and figure out this brand identity? Because right now, what both of you are doing are trying to get this active and activist communities going. Yeah. So how do you merge this, much like sports branding and sports marketing, how do you merge color design um, to create these communities? Um, well, you know, community has personas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one has to understand, you know, what is, what, is, what is the community going to be made up of, right? Um, and it's different characters, um, and that's uh, and 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 that's really important. Different characters that create different types of tones of voice, and that voice it needs to be expressed, right? So that brand character really, really um, starts to expose itself, and and once it exposes itself, you 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 know um, you know there's there's different ways to do this. You, you find d different devices that keep on sort of resonating and um, ev evoking who and what you stand for, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, with, with Re, uh, you know, we would look at it from the idea of the, 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 the sort of um, the prefix Re itself, the, re, you know, um, the, the idea of revolution and reimagine mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, and, and consider different sort of terminology from that. But then they also uh, started looking at different themes, a thematic approach to who they are. I mean, there's many a myriad of, of um, but fashion But all encapsulated, persons. I mean, I'm gonna go back to what you said initially, which was this backward E. Yeah. You know, um, it's, right. it's really interesting. So you're reimagining that that E has reimagined everything. It has reimagined everything. Exactly, and then you start to um, proliferate from that point. You, you start from a device and you blow that device up as big as you can, it blossoms. And, um, and that's an important factor. With the aspects of like Lululemon, it was very different. They had the community, but mm -hmm. they needed to, um, they needed to, they, they wanted to expand. Um, you know, they're really well known for the aspects of um, their apparel wear, the elements of yoga and, and, and exercise, but they were not known for other verticals. And they wanted to look, they wanted to expand into different verticals to open up that community mm -hmm. more so. But the way that we started it off was, um, you know, looking at their manifesto. When I talked to them initially, I was like, I don't know what the manifesto is. And they were like, it's on our bag. Yeah, it is. Right? <laughs> Anyone who's gotten it for a miles, or Lululemon, and he, anything, and I'm like, it's on the oh, bag. Oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. And that had to be reimagined. Um, um, and that was the first thing because it never really uh, interconnected to who they were, which is exceedingly funny, right? If you ever read any of their uh, parts of their manifesto. It's, it's, it's enlightening and it's also funny and you want to express that. But then it also was that you could, you could start to apply it to other things than just the blag. Um, 
and they do that again and again and again and again now. But the point um, what I want to make is the aspect of what Lululemon is trying to do is um, the other two verticals, their mindfulness or mind philosophy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and also um, the potential of going into the aspects of skin and body um, mm -hmm. and the sense of well-being. Uh, what, what you actually ingest within your, you know, your organ, the, this particular organ itself, right. the, most, the main organ. And they said that you have to keep that healthy. Um, and so what we did was uh, we came up with a, a different you know, aspect to their foundation, which is just sweat. That was it, sweat. We said, no, it's really more about sweat, grow, connect. Because that, that's who you need to be. That's who you need to be, and that's what your community is trying to do, yeah. right? And so that's why we started to um, play around with that. Um, Suzanne, you use color a lot in your design, especially with your socks. I am very into your socks, mostly because <laughs> my husband is also very into socks. And so, you know, it's, it's Hanukkah, he's Jewish, we <laughs> gift a lot of socks during the holiday, yeah, I love, right? I, I love socks. See, there you go. Uh, wrong brand. Yeah, wrong brand, wrong brand, sorry. He's a Swedish. So what, how do you, and I know, I know, Eddie's, you've written a book on, on color, but I wanna yeah, ask I you how you integrate color and how you use color as part of your design and creating a brand identity and, you know, making the tentacles out to your community? How do people identify with those socks? What, what, are you, what feeling are you trying to evoke as when someone goes and purchases those socks, what community are they part of? And how does color, uh, what role does color play in that? There is a heritage story about the palette, especially with the new collection, but you know, when you're saying you're for the active and the activists, you know, your palette has to reflect that also. And we want it to be aspirational, inspirational, and that just, you know, beg for a poppy color palette all around. And um, socks inherently are a little bit more colorful nowadays, so we like to stay on trend, but, you know, it, it really supports, you know, our mission and our values. Um, with our new collection, as you guys might have previewed, um, we do have the Jamaica colors. My late husband was from Jamaica, first generation immigrant, um, came over to the States when he was 16. So we do infuse that into the new collection to speak back to the heritage of why we started is to support the foundation. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, some history there as well. So heritage and just being, you know, bold and powerful is what we want to communicate. <coughs> um, we were, oops, I had my hand on my phone for a second. Um, we were talking about also, um, I love this, this aspect of design too. And again, I'm quoting you back to you. <laughs> you were talking about uh, the difference. You were talking about design trolling versus actual design criticism. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> can you tell us, I want to hear it from both of you, right. because there's so much. I mean, as you start building these communities and you're going out to social media and so many of these communities are built on social media and yeah. you know, social media platforms, where do you draw the line? Because it seems like it's a very fine line between design trolling and design criticism. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've come out many times about this, um, more so through uh, what I call bad journalism, um, <laughs> um, where um, you know certain characters have, uh, and, and this has been very rare for me, but um, you know for friends, uh, people that I know who are designers, um, just get totally trounced. They they sort of grab the work, post the work, and then write a couple of things that are so-called criticisms or appraisals, I have no clue, and then feed it to the dogs. Um, let's, you know, it's a feeding frenzy in regards to like one-liners of like, this is, this is, this is bad, this is, you know, shit, this is, you know, whatever, you know, my kid could do it, you know, I, I compute better, you know, uh, stuff out of my, you know, my mouth. And it's like, okay, um, stop, 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 stop. You're not, there's one, if you didn't like it, explain why you didn't like it. Right. Break it down for us so we can learn from you, right? So I use the, um, 
I use an example of the Eiffel Tower as a really great example. So if you go back into history and, um, you know, Gustav Eiffel, he's, he's got these designs uh, for the sort of, uh, you know, the World Expo, and the critics see it first before it's being built, and they totally trounce it. But the articulate aspect of how they trounced it was brilliant. Now, they were wrong in so many ways, right. but at least you can go back and look at how they've broken it down in their rational uh, elements. And that's what we're missing. We're missing a major, um, um, you know, a major point of view that we used to have in design that we just don't have in regards to criticism. Um, and we need that back. We need it back from um, you know, people that have you know, utilized Twitter or Instagram to just write one-liners uh, in, in, in regards to specific things. Okay, yes, everything is open. Yes, you must have a say, but have a, a, a clear, defined, um, practical um, you know, uh, appraisal of, of the work. I see so. that a lot in fashion criticism too, that um, everyone is a critic. And I think we've all, you know, seen it, you know, these one-liners that go viral that sometimes become, I mean, most of the time become noise with, and you know, and to your point, noise. they're not actual, they're not helpful. They're not helpful. So Suzanne, yeah. how do you, I mean, you've been in design for a long time, you have this line that's out there, how do you, how do you mute out the noise? I think you just have to have a very strong vision and conviction in what you're doing. And for me, because it's mission-based, it's easier to block it out. I can, you know, focus on what I'm doing and what I'm trying to achieve versus, you know, any kind of negative commentary. So for me, I think because I'm so passionate about what I'm doing, it just rolls off. Just yeah. Potter protects mine. <laughs> Done. Probably the best. Probably the best way to handle something like that. And I'll add to you know we were talking. Eddie and I were talking about Elon Musk, who does a fair amount of his own trolling. Sure. By the way. Yeah, he does. <laughs> so, yeah. but I mean, a lot of people criticize him for Tesla, and mm -hmm. look what it's become. You know, financially too, it's it's more. You know, it has a bigger valuation than GM and like all the car companies or, combined, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, I mean, I think part of innovation also is getting criticized and, you know, people not understanding or you know, not seeing the vision yet because you might be far ahead. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something else to keep in mind if, you know, people are, are being haters, um, yeah. you know, just, you know, do, you know, listen to criticism, but at the same time, I think it's important to stay true to your vision. Speaking of vision, Virgil Abloh, untimely death of Virgil Abloh, I mean, this is a a visionary, he's a fashion visionary, he's a design visionary. Um, it has impacted, I don't even think people realize how he has impacted our lives. I mean, from, you know, high level designers to journalists who cover this to everyday people that are walking around. You all are, you know, on his level, right? Um, in that, in that, in, in design and thoughts, how, how has his and how is his legacy going to impact your creativity going forward? My creativity. That's a, that's really interesting. I, I think that you know, um, Virgil was, um, and we were talking about him earlier, that he was an eclectic force. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, you know, architect and partial engineer um, that um, you know could take um, from many, extract from many different areas and start to apply it with clear rationale, right? With clear thinking um, to a fashion audience mm -hmm. um, that, um, w you know, was to a certain degree, um, that can be to a certain degree narrow-minded. <laughs> um, and, and, and also being black as well, um, um, really, uh, the, you know, garnered the sense of energy that, you know, what the likes of myself and others really need. Um, and he's not quite, you know, he's a quiet person, but he's not quiet about it. You know, he you know, had what, what, 1.6 million um, um, followers on Instagram and, um, you know, to his credit. 
And it's a really sad, it's, it's a sad moment um, in, in time because I was just saying, Sam, there's not many of us <laughs> as we've just talked about right. um, out there that can start to establish new ways of, of thinking. But, you know, he had that ability, he had that spirit. And, and, and so, you know, I've been, I've been in a bit of a funk. Um, I, personally, in, in, in my words, uh, for I would say you know half a year, pandemics kind of put me in this type, of, this, to, this particular predicament, and I've got to just say fuck it, let's just just go for it. Um, um, and it does depend upon. I have very different kinds of clients uh, than the, the uh, aspect of Virgil, but you know how can I perform? How can I elevate myself? How can I push forward? How can I push my team forward in an entirely different way? Um, and with people saying, well, that's really weird. And I'm like, well, define what weird is. Yeah. You know, what is it? it it's, I think mine's gonna have to. I would say. <laughs> there it is, okay. It's unique. It's unique. And, and his, I think his ability to just embrace that and move forward with that and just, you know, um, not give an F. Right. And just I've never seen and that really, before. And you know, we right. talked a lot about the the uh, the um, the ability to believe in yourself and the self worth. And I yeah, think, yeah. you know, that is so important if you really want to. I mean, I, I've seen it, you know, in so many different verticals and industries. But those people that are true visionaries really have this like self, like strong self worth. And it also goes back to you know elevating these generational, you know, these generations and through their traumas. Um, Suzanne, how has, I mean, we were talking about it with Eddie, uh, what, how has, has Virgil and his legacy had an impact on you? I mean, he's one of my favorite designers and um, we actually have a mini book um, about Virgil and I had to restock it today. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, it's been a bestseller always mm -hmm. you know people really just connect to the story and I was telling Eddie earlier I really admire that he was a trained architect mm -hmm. he was a skateboarder like mm -hmm. he transitioned all of that to the highest levels of luxury and it's inspiring to me because I'm a brand designer I have no business being a fashion right but I've been able to take those skills and my knowledge of that industry and translate it and it's been really fun and refreshing for me like to use a new medium mm -hmm. and see how much you know color theory and branding and messaging and just experience design goes into it that I can translate it mm -hmm. so for me seeing him you know be able to go fluidly through the different industries um, and use his experience and creativity is just beautiful I mean he didn't even call himself a designer like yeah. he never, never does, no. you know that was one thing about him too and um, do you feel like design, I mean, do you think design is like a lot of things becoming more fluid and before you would have designers in specific sectors, now design is kind of going across. You could be an industrial designer and design clothes. You can, yeah. Um, yeah. whereas 20, you know, 10 years ago even, you didn't really see that. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, that's, that's, been, that's been happening um, and it's a really great thing. Um, to do, and we at Pentagram, we're we're also trying to do that as well, um, trying to um, move through different mediums. Um, uh, I must say, and um, it's exciting, it's fun mm -hmm. um, uh, to take on uh, new challenges, not to solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, I was just talking to Suzanne in regards, oh, yourself in regards to like, did I solve the problem of a table? Not necessarily, you know, <laughs> um, uh, or a chair. Um, no, you, you're enhancing it. You're making it more comfortable. Over the course of centuries, this, is ha this has happened. I did not solve the problem of, of a chair. <laughs> and so the, the fact of the matter is, I, don't, I seriously don't believe that, it's, um, you know, the likes of Virgil would also say the same thing um, because he, said, he didn't ever say he was a designer. But he made people so happy. So happy. Right? Yes. So that's, 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 this that's, is very true. that's a really important thing to, you yeah. know. Off-white. Gift me off-white and I am very happy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is Giving Tuesday and I want you to talk about your organization um, that is in the name of your, of your husband um, 
and what exactly it does and how people can, can get involved if they want to or you know, obviously give um, to this organization. So um, we started UCAL McKenzie Breakaway Foundation in 2009 and we're now in two markets. We're in Boston and Hartford and hopefully New York City. <coughs> have a plan we have a plan so um, we really like I said serve city youth uh, from lower income households and also um, single parent households as well and 8 to 18 boys and girls and it's really about opportunity empowerment like we give them education that they, they can use on and off the field so everything from financial literacy um, we do timely things we did social justice this year We've done suicide prevention, and one of my favorite things we introduced was yoga. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they're never gonna sit still. This is gonna be a disaster. <laughs> and it was like so peaceful. And I didn't take into consideration, again, safe spaces, a chance to actually relax yourselves. And yes, sometimes they're kind of move around a little bit more, but like it was really like interesting for me to see that, you know? Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, for Giving Tuesday, you can either make a straight donation to the foundation, um, right on the website, super easy, ucalbreakaway.com. And then obviously through AbleMade, that's our, our ethos and what we've done since the beginning. So proceeds, um, we're boosting it up to 25%, 30% um, over the next week or so. So that proceeds will help you know, deliver the programming that we give to the, to the kids. And I have to say, I have toddler twins and I, I, you know, nothing is more important than seeing um, parents, uh, not, not parents, but teachers getting involved in their lives mm -hmm. and helping them and educating them. I mean, things that I never knew, I don't think, you know, before that never even occurred to me, like yoga. They came home and they yeah. were doing these poses, but like, That's right, yeah. it just, it, it sort of has an impact on them. And it's very, as, as, as you know, as youth, you know, I think there are a lot of, kids here in New York City that have the privilege of having a lot of these programs everywhere, but there's also, there's youth that don't. So this is very important um, to have that involvement from adults and people that care and teaching them basics um, in, a, in, a, in a smart, fun way. I think that's really, um, it's really important, so. And we like to sneak it in. Like, we're like, you're not really learning, you're having fun. You're so having like, fun. one of the most popular sessions we've done was with um, Capital One for financial literacy, and they had this like running exercise, and they were like playing, and like, they didn't even realize like, that they were kind of in, in school. <laughs> so it was really, really cool. And also we have a partnership with Jaden Smith's Just Water, which is the water we have here on the nice. panel and it's a plant-based packaging. So, you know, when they're getting the water, they're also learning about sustainable packaging and what that means. So, like, they're kind of, you know, through all of our experiencing, um, it's designed, mm -hmm. you know, to be fun and not feel like you're just sitting in class. It's designed to be experiential and engaging and thought-provoking. Right. All right, well, we have some time for questions. If anyone has any for these luminaries, um, please ask away. Yes. Um, there are so many social issues in poverty to care about these days, obviously. How, how do you choose and differentiate between them in terms of what you focus on for your business, and especially in terms of how design impacts um, these social causes? That's a really, really good question. Um, I think of late that, um, I've, um, I've started focusing on, on um, sustainable uh, goals. I think it's really based upon um, a workshop I was doing at RISD, uh, the School of Design, uh, for years back. And I, I, had to, I wanted to come up with a, a, a particular concept. And I started reading about the, the UN Sustainable Goals. Um, um, and it was, it was because of a another client of mine that was focusing attention on uh, politics and um, I didn't know so much about it and and then I uh, and then I did and I was like wow how, how do we how do we take all these 17 goals with all these particular factors in it and start to utilize it in design or um, and I, I would say it's just it's taken it's taken quite some time but now I've got you know a few clients that are really really focused uh, uh, within this uh, 
this particular area a lot, lot more, and I'm exceedingly happy and excited about what the, what's to come. Uh, um, in regards to the impact, you know, um, design can actually have. Uh, imagine it uh, like this, where um, one of our clients is a, you know, they have this amazing technology. Uh, it's really sustainable. It's within, I, I'll, I'll just say, of the paint area. That's it. I, that's all I can say. And it, it's definitely going to revolutionize the way that we, you know, breathe, to be honest, in a particular space. Um, they hadn't really thought so much about, you know, they talked about sustainability to a certain degree. They were very much scientists, but they really needed to blow that up and build the aspects of community and really, um, um, you know, uh, preach to that community what they're trying to provide in a healthier, um, um, more sustainable way. And, you know, I was just, we were just talking about um, Kate Ray, Rayworth's uh, work with the donut economy and the balance in regards to what we need to have in this world. We can't overshoot and we can't have a shortfall. We need to have that balance within that, 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 that donut. And you know, we can't measure everything by GDP. We should measure everything by our happiness and content. And so that creates more balance. And so when we started talking about this to them and told them, told them to watch Kate Rayworth, they were like, okay, we're gonna do it. And they were like stunned and they were like, okay, we can really help and uh, you know, balance the people, you know, things out for everybody in this particular world of ours. And I was like, yeah, that's great, you know. Um, uh, and that's what we're trying to do for them um, with the work that we're Suzanne, how do, how do you incorporate that into your business? I think well, I think for me, the connective tissue for any project we take on is inclusivity. Um, through Able Me, we not only helped the foundation, but we started with collaborations with different designers. We raised over $30,000 for VH1 Save the Music Foundation. We sent 120 kids to school for a year mm -hmm. through Pencils with Promise. Um, and for me, the connective tissue is always inclusivity. And through the pandemic, I've learned what a differentiator that is for us. And you know, from the makeup of our own internal team, we're really reflective of the community that we serve. So um, it kind of happens organically with me because of my friends and like my just network. But I, I've come to understand that's not the same for everybody. Um, my first three angel investors were all people of color. Two of the three were women. Um, that's reflected in my management team as well. Um, and you know our models, I know it's, it's timely to do that for marketing purposes right now, but we've been doing it since day one and mm -hmm. it's just who we are, it's mm -hmm. in our DNA. And I think the kids see that in our team when we're, we're working with them is that they see themselves in us and I think that's really important. And I think just uplifting and, and being as inclusive as possible is really important. Okay. And it makes, it makes things better too, the end result's better when you have yeah. inclusivity and different perspectives. I'm yep. seeing that more and more. I mean, it is so important, even you know, in design, but also in journalism too. When you have different voices and different perspectives, and localized, it's 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 really important, especially when you're talking about things like the economy and small business. Um, I think we are at time, right? Okay, so I'm, we're going to wrap it up. But I want to thank you all for coming, no, thank, thank and thank you, you all, thank the you. esteemed panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Thank you.